we have two sermons left in Philippians. And then um, we will be having Evangelist Will Galkin speaking to us the week after that. And then we're going to start a new uh, um, mini-series um, through Revelations two, Revelation 2 through 4. A short series at that time on the seven churches uh, that are addressed in that book of the Bible. Uh, and then after that, we are going, by God's grace and Lord willing, to jump into the New Testament book of Matthew and to go through an exposition of the book of Matthew um, entitled, the sermon title for that is King of Kings. So we've got to finish up this in Philippians and I'm excited. I've had a, a, a very delightful year in being able to study this book of the Bible. I want to thank you as a church. You know, the, the scripture describes that one of the chief reasons, or actually the chief reason why um, pastors uh, should receive their um, support and compensation through the church is so that they can spend their time um, in the Word and prayer. It's what Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, what the apostles indicate, um, what Paul tells Corinthians. It's all over the place. That's the idea there. Um, and although that is your responsibility, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you this morning for fulfilling that responsibility with, with graciousness. Because I really have enjoyed being able to spend literally hundreds of hours in this short book of the Bible this last year. And to be able to then teach you what God is teaching me through it is, is a delight. So thank you for being um, obedient and faithful to that calling of God. Um, so that we can spend so much time in four chapters and really get into it deeply. So I have two sermons left. Be looking in verses um, 14 or 14 through 19 this morning, and then 19 through 23 next week. These are the final recorded words of the Apostle Paul to what could be described as his favorite church. Um, the occasion for writing this letter, as we've seen all along, was a heart that had been warmed by their generosity and love tangibly expressed, while he, Paul, God's servant, is incarcerated unjustly by a hateful, pagan, madman of an emperor. Yet, we've noticed, I think you've noticed, I've noticed very clearly, there is no whining dripping from the quill of God's preacher through this letter though he is in an awful circumstance. Instead, there is the opposite. There is obvious delight and joy. But not a delight in the simple reception of a material gift. He's not simply excited and writing a letter of joy and not whining because he's thinking, well, they gave me such a generous gift. If I whine now, they're going to think I'm ungrateful. <laughs> No, it's, it's a true, genuine joy that the Apostle expresses. And it's not a joy that's based upon the gift itself. Um, it was for the Apostle Paul, in this kind of a situation, it was indeed the thought that counted. <coughs> he expresses that. Remember how he opened his letter writing, not, I thank you for the gift, but he opened the letter writing, I thank you, I thank my God upon all your remembrance of me. In other words, he was not thanking them that he got a gift from them, but thanking them, you remembered me. It was the thought that counted so much from him. And from these words and what he wrote following in these four chapters, we got the sense that it is as if Paul was saying, I am thrilled and praising God that after all these years, you thought of me and it couldn't have come at a better time. And although the thought did count dearly to the Apostle, the fact that their thoughts were communicated to him through a very helpful and generous money gift sent by the hands of a very humble and gracious servant of the church, Epaphroditus, was just icing on the cake. The love that was being manifested here. But I have noticed, and I think you probably have too, is, is I've had spent hundreds of hours in this book of the Bible this year, that Paul's delight was not even mainly in the sacrificial financial gift, or even the sacrifice of Epaphroditus. Because Paul's deep-hearted joy and full-throated song of delight was that this dear church was doing well spiritually. And that they loved the gospel and those who preach the gospel. Notice the text as we come to this final words. Verse 14. Notwithstanding, you have well done. 
that you did communicate, or remember, that's the word fellowship, with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, as we come before you this morning, opening your word up, we ask that your spirit would do what only he can do. Please open our hearts and our minds to receive the word with gladness, to examine these things to see if they be so, and then to go from this place and be obedient to your word with love and gratitude. Lord, we ask that you would make us a generous church. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This was indeed a rarity, what Paul experiences through the Philippian church. There were good churches from Jerusalem to Antioch, Ephesus to Thessalonica, uh, and even Corinth is praised for some goodness. But no New Testament letter matches the joy and the gratitude and the generosity of the Philippian church. We have no revelation of any other church that Paul had any part with that had this kind of commendation that he gives. See, Paul's delight was that this church that had been begun by God's grace by holding a women's prayer meeting down by the river, delivering a demon-possessed slave girl, and singing hymns in jail, that's how the church was started, that this church understood and practiced true fellowship in the gospel, true partnership in the gospel. In other words, they got it. Even today, it is a rarity for churches to truly love the gospel and those who preach it. The Bible warns us that in the last days, people will not, more and more people will not indeed love the gospel and love those who preach it, but rather they will love themselves and so they will heap to themselves teachers having ears to be tickled. That's what is described what happened in the latter days and Paul was anticipating this even in his day. But the Philippian church was in stark contrast to this phenomena. Instead, the Philippian church was one that got it. He says, you did well. You're doing well. You got it. Often churches select their pastors based upon personality, likability, charisma, skillfulness, regardless of whether or not those pastors know, believe, and teach the entirety of God's gospel without ad lib. It is a rarity for even good churches today to put aside cultural and traditional, traditional and preferential ideas out of love for the plain and clear gospel. It is not common today for churches to be willing to change practices or hold fast uh, to practices when and if those support the clear words of the gospel. Many churches define themselves as warm or intellectual, relaxed or reverent, traditional or progressive. But where are the churches that define themselves or can be defined as gospel and word driven? It is a rarity for a church to have a proper understanding and devotion to fellowship in the gospel. And that is not a new phenomenon. That is what Paul is expressing. It was a rarity even in his day. Because people don't change. Humanity is the same. The things that could be said in the, new, in, the, in the first century can be said today. And often the things that could be said today could be said in the first century. And all the time in between. Many churches in that day and today opt for the more popular definition of fellowship, which is little more than a cup of coffee and talking about maybe Jesus-y feelings. But the fellowship Paul is delighted to share with the Philippian church is far less like a book club or a game night and more like soldiers huddled together in a foxhole while the enemy mercilessly shells them with mortar rounds. That's the kind of fellowship he's talking about. That's the kind of partnership in the gospel he is ascribing to this church at Philippi. 
Fellowship according to God's Word is sacrificial. It is praying, it is praising, it is learning, it is teaching, it is encouraging, it is giving, it is weeping, it is convicting, it is serving. It is in relationships like this with those that have gone all in for the advancement of God's kingdom. No matter what the cost and the pain that comes with it. And this is what he is meaning when he says, you've done well. You've been with me in this battle all along. He never once gave up. He didn't stop. Ten years later, you were with me when I left Macedonia. You were with me when I went to Thessalonica and Corinth. And you're with me while I'm in the Roman prison. You're with me. And you're with the gospel. And I love you for it. This is what he saw in the Philippian church. And this is why he is so delighted. They got it. You see, it wasn't about them. It was about Jesus' gospel marching onward to war against the powers of darkness. And they would sacrifice anything and everything to see the gospel advance. This is what describes them. And he says, you partnered with me. Verse 14, you did communicate, partner, fellowship, koinonia. You partnered with me with my affliction. So we remarked last time, we were in this text two weeks ago, reading verses 10 through 14, Paul is expressing joy that their care had bloomed into fruition now that they had opportunity, but his smile of appreciation is punctuated with the apostle informing them of this truth. His joy was not based upon a need met, rather it was based upon the obvious fact that they had done well as partners in his affliction. Now it's best to understand Paul's affliction as the immediate need and the struggle he has while he's incarcerated. It's in the context, his affliction, he means now, while I'm in jail. You didn't abandon me when many others were embarrassed by me, and thus they were preaching Christ, trying to get me more persecuted, like he talks about in the first part of the letter. You didn't abandon that. You stayed with it. But some might say, well, he was a prisoner. What did he need? How could they partner with him while he's a prisoner? Well, in the last chapter of Acts, Acts 28, verses 30 and 31, we actually find out that Paul's time in Rome was very difficult. He had one thing that might say is a good thing. He wasn't in a dark, dank prison cell. He was in what's called house arrest. Well, the text goes on to tell us it wasn't all rosy. He was on house arrest. He had to be there. He couldn't leave, but he had to pay the rent. And he had to fund his own life while he's in house arrest. But he can't leave. How do you go and get a job to pay for the house when you can't leave the house? They didn't have the internet to do online home businesses, right? What's he going to do here? He's in this affliction. He's in this place where he's there. The Bible tells us Acts 28, interestingly, that while he's doing this, it was a house of his own hire, meaning he had to pay for it himself. But it said that he couldn't leave, but everyone who came to him received everyone who came to them and taught them the gospel. He just wouldn't quit. The Romans put him under house arrest and said, you can't leave. In fact, you've got to pay for your own stay here in this house. And so Paul says, okay. And then people come to hear the gospel. He said, if you won't let me go out, I guess God will bring them in. And that's exactly what happened. The Philippian church recognizes this, and so they send financial support to Paul to help pay for these things. They recognize the need here. And that's what he's describing. That's the situation he's in. But lest the church should misunderstand and think that Paul's gratitude was based solely upon getting money when he needed it most, he clearly points out in verses 11 through 13 that he is trusting Christ to strengthen him and that he was okay physically and was content with whatever Christ would bring his way. He is not thanking them. In other words, he's not thanking them out of panic need. Um, but rather out of calm joy based upon the fact that their thoughtful, thoughtfulness means that they love the gospel and gospel proclaimers. And that's it. So he wishes to close the letter with personal thoughts about the generosity of this church. And we see in verse 15 that Paul is making sure that he's clearly pointing out that he is not praising their obedience in order to flatter them. He says, now you Philippians, you know. <laughs> you know that this is not why. He's not trying to butter them up or to procure more of a gift. Yeah, you remember, maybe you, this wasn't the true, true of you, but I remember how, your, how my mom would tell me when I was young that to say um, thank you when given a gift. I remember how we were taught in mere politeness, that's 
True, we should always say thank you when given a gift. But one of the reasons why, you're, we, why I remember being told, I don't remember if my mom told me this or someone else did, but I remember being taught one of the reasons you should give a gift is because ungrateful people um, don't get a second gift. Right? The idea there being that if you don't ever say thank you, don't write thank you notes to those people, next time it comes around to your birthday, they're not going to send you a gift. And this idea is part of our culture, the way we think about things, and I don't even think it's necessarily a bad thing. There's a reality to that. Um, Yet, that's not why Paul's writing. He's not saying, well, I better tell them thank you so that um, when I have a need again, they won't be, well, we helped him last time and you saw how ungrateful he was. Well, we're not going to help him again. It's not why he's writing. He's not writing to get something. He says there's no personal motive behind his gratefulness. No strings attached. A case he makes clear in these verses we read this morning. Instead, Paul expresses their generosity and his gratefulness because they had a long-standing partnership. We read those verses this morning. He tells them, you and I both know this to be true. That's literally what that says in verse 15 when he says, now you Philippians know also. It's literally, you and I also know. We both know this to be true. And what do we know to be true? <clears throat> that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no other church communicated or fellowshiped with me like you did. None gave me concerning giving and receiving what you did. So from the very beginning, it's a long-standing partnership. It's been 10 years since he planted this church. He's saying, all this time, you've been there. A long-standing partnership. You are the one church that has consistently been partnering with me in the gospel when it comes to financial support. And Paul had expressed this, expressed this earlier in verse 10 when he says, you, you always had this thought for me. You just didn't have all the opportunity. He didn't mean in verse 10 that they had never concerned themselves with the needs of the gospel ministry he was engaged in. He was simply saying that he knew that they cared about him, but now at the end of his ministry, they were again there to love him with, and love the gospel with their generosity. In fact, we notice in verse 15 that he describes their koinonia, their fellowship, their partnership, that it began in the beginning of the gospel. Now, what in the world does Paul mean when he says in the beginning of the gospel? Now, some have all kinds of convoluted views concerning this. I think it's a lot simpler than all of that. But Some have even suggested, I was reading one person that suggested that Paul was admitting that before Philippi he had preached a false gospel. And then he got to Philippi and from then on he really started preaching the gospel the right way. Uh, well, that's just ridiculous. Um, we, Paul didn't preach a false gospel at any time. Ever since he said, Lord, what will you have me to do on the Damascus road? He was preaching the gospel that God had taught him. What does this mean, though, the beginning of the gospel? Because we know the gospel, Philippi wasn't there. Um, they weren't when the gospel began with Jesus or with Jerusalem or, or, or Antioch or all these other places. No, it's very simple. It's actually this. Paul is saying, in the beginning of, when I began the gospel with you, from the very beginning of my Macedonian visit, you were there. You received me. You received the gospel. You see, Paul was wanting to go and preach the gospel in Asia Minor. He was wanting to preach the gospel there. He had gone a little bit in southern Asia Minor, modern Turkey. A little bit of, he gone south a little bit in there. And he preached the gospel there. Well, now he was wanting to go back there. But then God intervened in Paul's life through a Macedonian vision. And, he, and, a, and a person, a being of some type, a spirit being or an individual of some type, appeared to Paul in a vision and said, Come over here to help us. And Paul talks about how he was forbidden from going to to um, rest of Turkey and to go over into to um, Macedonia. From Macedonia, he went down the coast of Greece into Thessalonica and Berea and Athens and Corinth, and he went down over there. And then what we find is from then on, Paul's ministry is always focused in Greece and Rome and Spain and further out. So I believe what Paul is describing here when he says from the beginning of the gospel, he's talking about two things. He's talking about his second stage of ministry. When God launched him into the ministry where he was going to be going to the uttermost part of the earth. But also referring to the fact that when the gospel was preached to them in Philippi, they received it, they believed it, and they started supporting him right away. They supported what he was doing right away. From the beginning of the gospel... And he says, when I departed from Macedonia, we went from Macedonia down to uh, Thessalonica. From Thessalonica to Berea. 
And Paul is saying, when I left Macedonia, and, and when Paul speaks of Macedonia, he's almost always referring to Philippi, the chief city in Macedonia. He went down to Thessalonica, then he went, then went down to the rest of Greece and those places. But from the beginning of when they had heard the gospel and loved Jesus and God's truth and God's messengers, their hearts were opened with generosity to see the truth of God in Christ to continue on. And so, not only did they pour out generosity and support Paul at Philippi, but when he left Macedonia, no other church fellowshiped him in giving and receiving in this regard, like the Philippian church did. And after leaving Macedonia, Paul went to Thessalonica. Verse 16, it says, For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again to my necessity. By the way, just a quick little um, side note. This is why scholars believe when Paul uses the word Macedonia, he's referring to Philippi. Because technically, Thessalonica is in, Phil is in Macedonia. But the fact here that he uses Macedonia and then singles out, singles out even in Thessalonica is an indication that he's referring to Philippi when he speaks of Macedonia in a separate place, Thessalonica, when he refers to that. Just a little commentary side note if you're reading that in commentaries. But there at Thessalonica, Paul entered into persecution from the Jews. And he had to quickly leave Thessalonica and go to Berea, being run out of town. But in those dark days of persecution in Thessalonica, this brand new baby church, the one just started, the one just started by the demon-possessed girl, the women at the river, and the jailer, that church, they were with him in Thessalonica. They partnered with him there. You see, why would they do that? When one's life is radically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, he cannot help but long to see others' lives radically changed by that same gospel. And this was the Philippian church. They had been radically changed by God. And they said, here, what do you need? How can we help others hear this beautiful message? And that's what we see here in Thessalonica. And he uses this idiomatic phrase. It says, sent once and again. Literally in the Greek, it's sent once and twice. But it just means, doesn't mean two times. It's a Greek idiom that means over and over and over again. So their support of him was not just a gift in Thessalonica. It was continuing on. Well, actually, if we look over to another book of the Bible, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, we find in verses 8 and 9, something Paul is saying. Remember I said he went um, to um, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, short little detour in Athens, and then Corinth. Okay, In Corinth, writing to the Corinthian church later on, this is quite a bit later after he's been out of Corinth. And he writes this in 2 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. Well, I'll back up to verse 7. You see, the problem in the Corinthian church, one of the main problems at this point he's dealing with at this juncture, is that they had finally got to the point where they said, you know what, you know Paul tells us all these things, but who does he think he is? He's just doing this. He just wants to come and, and see us. He just wants to come back to Corinth because he wants to get our money. Yeah, that's all preachers want anyways. It's money. And we have these other... Guys, who I think are better apostles than Paul. That's what's going on. That was one of the things going on in Corinth. And Paul writes to them and goes, Are you kidding me? <laughs> I started the church there. With my own labor, I started the church. In verse seven, he, six, uh, 7, he says, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? So did I offend you by being humble? Did I, humble? did I offend you because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Now, he's not meaning he literally put on a mask and robbed other churches. He's saying, I took from what they were using, to, they sent me support, and it, hurt, it was sacrificial. It hurt them to send me support. And I received that from them. By the way, quick little side note. Uh, I know that um, some religions, specifically the one here in Utah, believes that it's more noble for a minister to not get paid for their work here, and they use Paul as an example, this passage of Scripture completely debunks that. Because did not Paul receive financial support for the gospel ministry? 
He says right here, I did. And Paul didn't turn him down, did he? He received it. I took it. Just a quick side note there. He says, I received this to do you service. And then in verse 9, And when I was present with you and wanted, or I was lacking, I was chargeable to no man. He's basically saying, even when I ran out of money from their support, I didn't come to you and ask for anything. The church that should have been paying him. By the way, there is that underlying assumption that they should have been giving to him. He was serving them. That's where they should have been giving. He said, I, I didn't take anything from you. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren, which came from Macedonia, supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so I will keep myself. And he says, and if I come back, don't worry, I'm not going to come back and ask for any money. It's not what I'm coming back for. In fact, he's telling the Corinthians, because of all the hard things he's going to say to them, in fact, I'm not taking any money from you. <laughs> because it seems like you just don't get it. Now, why would he willingly take money from Philippi, but not Corinth? Philippi was partners with him in the gospel. They were on the same page. They were delighting in giving him the financial support so he could spread the gospel. He had a lot of hard things to say to the disobedient Corinthians. And he didn't want any kind of stumbling block to be in place. In fact, we find that him refusing financial support is only in Corinth where he refuses it. Only in regarding to Corinth. It doesn't mean there weren't times he also worked. Paul did both. He received from the churches he was ministering in. He received from churches that were ministering from without. And he worked. He did it all to get the gospel out there. The whole idea here is that Corinth. Oh, how this church gave God's servants headaches. One particular headache, as we already mentioned, was that after laboring faithfully there, the church had the gall to suggest that Paul was in it for the money. Although he says, that's not even logically possible, because you never gave me any money. <laughs> it's not even possible. But he pointed out, as we read, that he re robbed other churches, taking wages from them, and specifically points out the Philippian church, the Macedonian church, the brothers from Macedonia. You see... While he was in Corinth, the Philippian church was providing for him. For that which was lacking to me, the brothers from Macedonia supplied. So we find this bigger picture, right? While he was in Philippi, when he went down to Thessalonica, when he went to Corinth, you get what Paul's saying here, right? Over and again, time and time again, you have shown me that you love the gospel. You love its advancement. You want others to hear it. Romans 15, 25 through 28. We preached on this several years ago. In this passage of Scripture, Paul actually tells the Roman church that they ought to send money back to Jerusalem. And the reason they ought to send money back to Jerusalem is they said, because if you've received such spiritual blessing from Jerusalem, how did they receive spiritual blessing from Jerusalem? Well, the apostles and disciples all came from Jerusalem. You've received such spiritual blessing from Jerusalem, you ought to send physical blessing back. It's a principle that he's giving here. And the Philippian church got this principle. But notice down here in verse 17, Paul wants to correct the thinking just in case they misunderstand. Understand, once again, Paul wants to be sure the church understands why and why, he, why not. He's writing thing, these things. And it's certainly not that he wants another gift. Not because I desire a gift. He's saying, I'm not telling you thank you. I'm not flattering. I'm not talking about how you served me in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Corinth. I'm not saying all that because uh, I want a gift. No, actually, um, he says in verse 18, I, I'm actually good. I have all and abound. I'm doing well. In fact, I, I, I'm actually financially stable right now. I'm abounding. I am full. I got what you sent through Epaphroditus. It was such a blessing and I got it. You see, he didn't want to put on his fundraising hat for a little while. Rather, he is certain to encourage them that he's not writing out about financial woes, but a grateful heart for the past 10 years. Over and over again, the church that had proved that indeed they loved the gospel and longed to fellowship in this gospel with Paul, the one preaching the gospel. They are fellow soldiers. They are partners in God's gospel business. So I look at this text and I step back and say, and I say, thank God for generous churches and generous people of God like the Philippians. 
For every disappointment in Corinth, there is a blessing in Philippi. And generous churches like Philippi for the last 2,000 years is what has enabled the gospel to cross oceans and mountains, to enable someone to preach the gospel and to plant churches in the West and to train disciples to share that gospel with others and to make sermon audios available and to print books and Bibles and to fund pastors and missionaries to study the Word, equipping the saints to make disciples and through all of this to teach me the gospel. And so I thank God for generous churches. Because they are responsible for bringing the gospel to me in my need. Thank God for generous Philippian-like churches and members of such churches who sent money to help a struggling work in West Valley City to finish a meeting house that was well beyond their capabilities and to provide for the work of the ministry we see today. Thank God for such churches. But then I might be tempted to stop and think, yes, Thank God for those wealthy people who got the good jobs and those churches who were given financial stability and prosperity and ability to, an ability to be so generous. And I even think that way, and that's a normal way to think, but then the, word, the Scripture just turns it completely on its head because there's another passage of Scripture we need to understand. That's how we generally look at things, the generosity, that generosity is proportional to ability and abundance of resources, and we think that way. And we think, if God would make me prosperous like that, I would be generous too. But then I read a text in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. And turn there with me. It's just a little bit over from where you were in 2 Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians chapter 8, beginning verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, or we want you to know, of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Macedonia again, right? How that, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality or generosity. Wait, this changes everything. We've been talking about how the Macedonian church, the Philippian church, is regarded. I mean, think about it. How often have we read now about the Philippian church? Twice in Corinthians, he describes them, right? He says they helped him in Thessalonica, in Philippi, in Corinth. They were always there for the ten years once and again. And it might paint this picture. Well, of course they were. They had Epaphroditus to spare. They had the brothers that came down to Corinth to spare. They had money to spare. And so God had blessed them, and so they were generous with his blessing. But when I read this, I find out actually the opposite is true. Paul describes their financial situation as that of deep poverty. The Philippian church was the most generous church we have recorded to us in the Bible. And they are also the poorest church we have recorded to us in the Bible. How does that work? I tell you what it does. It goes completely against our 21st century American sensibilities. It just does not resonate with us. We just don't think that way. And yet that's what we find from the plain facts of Scripture. Their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their generosity. But then again, as we read this morning in Corinthians, it is often that God uses the confusing things, the foolish things that we might consider ridiculous to be confounding and confusing to the wise. Because we find that when Jesus was watching those who cast into the treasury and the Pharisees came in and gave of their abundance, and then a poor widow comes in and gives her last two mites, Jesus doesn't say she had a better heart, she was more generous, she was more nice, she was more kind. He simply says, very unequivocally, she gave more. She gave more. Because God does not measure quantity. Does not measure quantity. He measures the heart. She had a generous heart. This church has a generous heart. It very well may be, I don't know, it very well may be that these gifts were not actually very large. But they gave. They were generous. In their deep poverty. So I believe in our sermon this morning, I think looking at these verses, we have accurately understood the heart and mindset of both the apostle and the church. A grateful apostle, a generous church. And I pray that God would give us, you and me individually and our entire church, a generous heart that doesn't measure things by quantity, but as God sees the heart. 
Generosity toward one another, toward the needs of this church and her shepherds. Generosity toward the spread of the gospel near and abroad, toward our neighbors and those whom God puts before us. A generous heart. We need generous hearts, and this is something in our entitlement-driven, pleasure-crazed culture that we need to frequently bring before God's throne in, in asking for His grace to be generous people. But I want to pause and say I do not say this because I desire a gift. As Paul said. But as what he said, the reason why we need a generous heart as a church. Because he goes on to say in verse 17, But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. My desire, along with the inspired apostles, is that God would make our church a generous church because it is a mark of a healthy, thriving child of God, an assembly of such saints to be known for their generosity. Yet, the Spirit through Paul does not view temporal prosperity as either a motive or expectation of a generous heart. It is not that we should think, if I am generous, God will experience an obligation to give me prosperity, happiness, and wellness. This is legalistic, blasphemous thinking is what's driving the itching ears of many charlatans and congregants around the world known as the prosperity theology. Yet we must not miss that Paul expects their generosity to be abounding in fruit to their account. And so God desires this church to be a generous church, not so that she will get some temporal good in return, but so that spiritual fruit will be abundantly credited to our account. Peter O'Brien puts it this way, the advantage that accrues to them as a result of their generous giving is God's blessing in their lives by which they continually grow in the grace of God until the return. It's a spiritual fruit he's talking about. God spiritually blesses a generous church. And as we earnestly desire the same thing for us that Paul desired for the church at Philippi, consider with me some practical principles emerging from this particular text of what it means to be a generous church, a generous soul, a generous individual who takes fellowship in the gospel seriously and joyfully. And I, got, I have four, I believe, quick five quick applications as we close this morning from the text of Scripture. First thing I notice is found in verse 15, and that is that generosity is the natural produce of redemption. The Philippian church was generous with their support of Paul. We already mentioned this in the beginning of the Gospel. So I will not rehash the details of what we experienced in Thessalonica and Corinth and Philippi and Rome and all these places. That the church had partnered with Paul through generation, um, through time, financial provision. Yet, think of this as an implication for our lives in obedience to the faith. It is the normal response of a redeemed soul to be generous in heart. It is the normal response. Because they got the gospel, they got generosity. They went hand in hand from the beginning of the gospel. When God had been so generous in giving us the plenty of His heavenly grace and the riches of eternal life, how could we be stingy with earthly and temporal gifts He has given us for time? We ought to be generous in our time, our love, our money, our attention toward the work of God. We know the principle that a forgiven person forgives. We've said that often. But it is equally true that the person who has received much understands this and desires to give much for the sake of Christ's name. Number one, generosity is the natural produce of redemption. Number two, gener generosity is the responsibility of the redeemed. No one else did, but you did. You sent once and again to my necessity. Here are the facts. God is capable and willing to provide for Paul and his necessity any way that God should desire. God would supply the need. And at times throughout redemptive history, God does indeed use unusual means to provide. Remember how the temple bread David ate was unusual. And remember how the um, ravens fed Elijah food, but it was an unusual. Yet the normal, ordinary way in which God provides for the support and advancement of His truth, His gospel, is through normal people who have been redeemed by that same gospel. That's how he chooses to provide for his work. This is why Paul simply points out that God used them once and again 
to His necessity. It is certain, as Paul reminds the Philippians in verse 19, that God will supply all your need according to the riches and glory of Christ Jesus. Verse we're going to examine next week more closely. But it is equally true that most often He chooses to fulfill that supply through simple, humble, and often even poor children of the redemption promise. That's how God does it. This is why we at Grace Baptist Church, we do not rely upon fundraisers, stewardship campaigns, giving pledges, or annual capital campaign banquets and such, nor do we check up on people to see if they're giving generously. We simply believe that generosity is the natural produce of the redeemed grateful heart and that God's people will be responsible to do that. We do not look outside the church to visitors and such to fund this ministry and her cause of spreading the gospel and the maturing of the saints. We look to God to encourage the hearts of her generous people who have committed to this assembly. That's who we look to. Number three, generosity is a mark of spiritual health. Health. I already mentioned this. We talked about how in verse 17 he is excited about this poor church's generosity, not because he was on the receiving end, but because their generosity is that which abounds to their account with spiritual fruit. A generous servant of the Lord looks at his possessions and advantages and gifts and abilities as a way to glorify God and increase the kingdom of God in the hearts of others, or at least partner with those who are involved in this work. When he says it is, he desires fruit that may abound to your account, whether he is speaking eschatologically, meaning reward at the judgment seat of Christ, or he is writing about present fruit and seeing the gospel have its effect because of their gracious gift, it's kind of hard to tell from the context. I think it's best to consider that maybe he's not talking about one or the other, but both. He's talking about the whole thing. Pointing out simply this, that both that physical generosity produces spiritual blessings. It brings me joy. I wanted to share with you all this this morning because this is an illustration of this in your own lives as this church. It brings me joy to report to you that there was an individual that for the first time in his life had gone to a church meeting in Shettles of Poland. His name was Mariusz. We prayed for him. He came to all the gospel uh, preaching sessions. His, his girlfriend was a member of the church and he came to all the preaching sessions that week of uh, camp that uh, we were able to do, I was able to do when I was there. And then he went to church after that and he had kept coming to church after the camp there. And two weeks ago, the church in Poland had the privilege of baptizing Mariusz because he has received Christ as his Savior. You see, this is what we're talking about here. Your generosity in sending teaching to the Poland has abounded with spiritual fruit to your account. Do you understand that? We are partners in the gospel with them. And we partnered with them. And God brought spiritual fruit to not only the labors of those in Poland, but our labors. It truly is a partnership. I was very excited when I saw the pictures of Mariusz being dunked in the river. It evidences that these things are true. Perhaps it's more than this. I am uncertain all that this means, but I do learn from this text that Paul was delighted that the church was so generous, not because he received some gift, but because through that gift, spiritual and eternal fruit would abound to their account. And it does, dearly beloved. When we partner in the gospel, all partners share in the fruit of their labors. All partners, the rich and the poor. We are laborers together with God's gospel. Number four, generosity is a way in which God's people worship. Generosity is a way in which God's people worship. Three phrases in verse 18. All of them appealing to the Old Testament descriptions of the temple worship. And all three phrases are applied to the generous provision the Philippians gave Paul as his partner in the gospel. They were not a visible part of the ministry in Thessalonica and Corinth, and now here in Rome. But they had been definitely an active part. And the use of this Old, Tem Old Testament temple language points to the provision Paul received was not only helpful, but it was worshipful. He calls it a sweet-smelling fragrance. Like the incense burned in the censer of gratitude to God for his, mercy, for his rich mercy. First used, this word sweet smell is first used in reference to Noah's sacrifice in Genesis 8.21. Then Leviticus 1.9 for the Levites. 
Then more clearly, he says, a pleasing or a welcome sacrifice, acceptable sacrifice. This is not saying their gift was sacrificial, although it was sacrificial, but he's pointing to the nature of the gift being that which is like the sacrifice of the Old Testament animals being burned up to God. Their gift is a welcome act of sacrificial worship. And then the third phrase, well-pleasing to God. That which glorifies and honors God above all. What is most fascinating to me is that Paul is is referring to a gift given to him to fill up his necessity. Not talking about that they had made a sacrifice to God, God, but they'd given it to him. In manifesting their tangible generosity, in supporting Paul as a partner in the ministry, their acts indeed were worship to God in similar tradition to the noble and holy tradition of the Levites. Be a worshiper, be generous. Before I move from this point, I wish to point out Ephesians 5.2. We don't have time to turn there. But the Apostle Paul uses the exact same language he does here at the end of verse 18 to refer to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Obviously, he's not saying that the sacrifice of Christ and the giving of this gift to Paul is identical. But by using the same language, we see what it means to be a partner in the gospel. That in the eyes of our Father, the obedient generosity of this poor church to meet the needs of this servant is as glorifying to God as the obedient sacrifice of the very Son of God before Him. They're both sweet smells to God. They're both rich fragrance to Him. Lastly, generosity has no reason to fear God's goodness. The last verse we'll look at next week, 419. Because it not only stands as a conclusion to this particular text, but it, it is a conclusion to the whole letter. We'll examine it more fully next week. Yet we must note as we close this morning that this promise of God's provision is not a response to generosity, as if one would give to get. The promise of supply and the word need are tied to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He's talking about spiritual provision here. He will supply all that you need. Everything you need to glorify God, He'll give you. And that includes physical need until the day you don't need it anymore. And He says, I want you with me. And in that day, you won't have what you need. Instead, you'll have something better than what you need. You'll have the eternal presence of God. And so we recognize that the lack of our need on this earth is not God being unfaithful in His promise, but simply saying, I have a better need to fulfill for you. Something that's lasting and eternal rather than temporal. But He will do it all. It's not a promise that you and I will not face poverty or hunger or pain or sorrow. It is a promise that in glory because of Christ, all this will come to an end. And while God desires our work on earth to continue, everything we need for that life of service will be supplied as it was to Paul even here. But be generous and fear not. You cannot outserve God. Cannot. We may tend in our wealthy society to spend ourselves into poverty, but I do not believe we can ever give ourselves into poverty. God provides now and forever. Let's pray.